On the 31st of October 1517, a German monk who had recently been teaching at the University of Wittenberg nailed a document to the church door, in effect its notice board. In it he raised 95 objections to the sale of indulgences, the pieces of paper sold by priests to alleviate suffering and purgatory. He didn't deny the existence of purgatory. He didn't tackle 101 other doctrines in the church, just the sale of indulgences. The church had stepped up the sale of these pieces of paper to finance a rather sorry bank balance in Rome. The monk, called Martin Luther, didn't set out to begin a revolution, nor did he set out to start a new church. But within 50 years the revolution had taken hold and a new church did emerge, the Reformation Church. Earlier that year he had what he would later call a born a new experience, as he realised reading through Romans that being right with God was not about being obedient to the church, but about receiving the free gift that came through Jesus Christ, through faith. But it was the question of indulgences that really got him going. However, in God's sovereignty, the Catholic response pushed Luther over the edge and into all kinds of new discoveries. It took Pope Leo X three years to respond to the man he called this drunken German. And when he did, it was to demand that Luther recant about half of the sentences in his 95 Theses. By then, things had moved on. Luther had written and explored so much more, fueled by his newfound faith and confidence in Scripture. By the time the big showdown between Luther and the Church arrived, it wasn't just the question of indulgences that were on the table. At the Diet of Worms in 1521, he made his famous assertion, Unless I am proved wrong by scriptures, or by evident reason, then am I a prisoner in conscience to the word of God. I cannot retract, I will not retract. To go against the conscience is neither safe nor right. God help me. Amen. So began Luther's reforms. Protected from the church by the German authorities, who themselves had grievances with the Roman church, Luther challenged everything against scripture. It was his view of scripture which drove him on, and motivated his translation of the Bible into German. Previously the Bible had only been available in Latin, and reading it was positively discouraged by the church, perhaps for obvious reasons. Luther said no. Not only is the Bible the word of God, but it should be available to all. Luther's discoveries in scripture were numerous. Some of the key highlights remain with us to this day. He viewed scripture like Jan Hus before him as being the sole authority for the church. Alongside this went his discovery of justification by faith alone. You cannot work for your salvation, he said, by doing certain things the church requires. It's a gift from God. Suddenly, believers were freed from the heavy burdens and the power of the local church. This meant that the sacraments no longer had the same weight. They were used by the Roman church to control the benefits of salvation. But once you realise that salvation came through faith, then the so-called sacraments fell away in importance. Luther retained just two, the Lord's Supper and Baptism. And both of these were not actually the way in which you were saved, as had previously been taught. This robbed the priesthood of its power. Indeed, said Luther, Scripture teaches that every believer is a priest, with access to heaven through the work of one great high priest, Jesus himself. And if Jesus saves us and makes us right, there is no place for purgatory. We go from this earth to heaven. Our sins are fully paid for by Jesus, said Luther, and entry is guaranteed with no further penalty to be paid. In a moment... That was an end to the Roman practices of indulgences. Looking back, it's hard to imagine how radical these discoveries were. There's no doubt that Luther didn't have everything right, but he was starting from a very, very low point indeed. And there were others too who were prepared to carry on the torch where he left off. The most significant of these was a Frenchman by the name of Jean Chauvin, more commonly known today as Calvin. Calvin was just eight years old when Luther nailed his objections to the church notice board. He took on, though, where Luther left off, and was perhaps the most significant figure in church history of all time. 
Calvin was born in France in 1509 and attended the University of Paris. A close friend, Nicolas Coe, was forced to flee Paris after making a reformist speech at the university. Calvin, who had written the speech for him, fled with him. Calvin ended up in Geneva, where the Protestant revival had already taken hold. It was a natural home for him. After a few short years there, he travelled to Strasbourg, nearby in France, where he became pastor, before returning to Geneva in 1541, where he remained until his death in 1564. It's difficult to overstate the profound influence that Calvin had on the reform movement. His main work was entitled Institutes of the Christian Religion, and he was always updating it and reforming it. It was a fluid, exciting time for the church, as they discovered what scripture really taught. Calvin's main contributions to the reform movement were in his Radical Institutes, and the completion of a commentary on every book of the Bible except Revelation, commentaries that are still in print and used today. He had a much fuller understanding of salvation than Luther managed to develop, focusing on the place God had in the scheme of things, issues such as election and predestination. He also developed the doctrine of the Lord's Supper, claiming that the bread and wine were elements or symbols of Jesus, rather than actually becoming Jesus' body and blood in any significant way. It's important to see that those early reformers were no saints themselves, neither were they free from error. Luther, for example, had a particular hatred for the Jews, which we would find abhorrent today. Calvin was very strong, as all the reformers were, on the relationship between church and state. And eventually he would have one of his opponents burnt at the stake. Both of them continue the practice of infant baptism. But we mustn't let these issues detract from their achievements. They were men of their time. But they took the church in its perilous state and used by God, they breathed life back into it. They are our true ancestors in the faith. Those who follow Calvin's teachings in particular are proud today to be known as reformed Christians. Today we summarise their teachings under five headings, each beginning with the Latin word sola, meaning only. In your groups now, look up these great truths in scripture and think how they are still relevant for the church today.